apologise. Uh, we finished last week on the section, Our Walk in the Spirit. Tonight we're on the home run. We're looking at the pattern of Romans chapter 6. And really, I would suggest it's the entire chapter that we need to look at. And we're going to start tonight by reading it because we'll be referring backwards and forwards to bits of it during the night and it'll save us having to open it and shut it all the time. Thank you, Father, for our time together tonight around your word. I pray you'll open our minds to, to absorb it, our hearts to embrace it, and our lives to live it out. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Yeah, I will, <laughs> except for that bit. Um, now, Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin, so how can we live to it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism uh, into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So it doesn't matter what your background is, it doesn't matter what your family situation is. It doesn't matter what your great-great-grandparents were getting up to. It's all under the blood of Christ and we have a new life to live. So if the old life is exerting any kind of a hold on you, it's time to realise that you're being conned. You're no longer chained to it. The trouble is we get into a habit of walking in certain ways and we keep on walking in those ways uh, and it's not necessarily beneficial. If we've been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Do you sort of get the message that Paul is driving this point home again and again and again? Sin and your past do not direct the course of your presence, present unless you choose to allow it to do so. And so many of the people I wind up having to counsel have chosen to let it do so. It's problems that come from the past that should not, just should not have any presence anymore because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ we believe we will also live with him for we know that as since Christ was raised from the dead he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died to sin once for all but the life he lives he lives to God. In the same way count yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the kernel of what the new creation message is. You are a new creation. You're not the old creation with a few renovations. You're not the old you with a smile painted on your face and all the, the old woes and griefs inside. You are a new creation living a new life. Okay, we don't wait till we get to heaven to start living a new life. That starts the moment we, we commit to Jesus Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Implication, you can let sin reign in your mortal bodies. So it is possible as a Christian to sin. Some people will try and tell you you can't. If that's the case, Paul apparently was very confused when he wrote this. I think I would trust Paul more so than any latter-day preacher. Um, do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness. Note the progressive tense of that. He's not saying you once did or you could have. He's saying do not. Um, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness for sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Okay? All of the Old Testament has to do with law. You can only please God if you do these things. And in this latter day, there are so many quasi-Christian groups who want to try and pull you back under law, even to the extent of saying, if you worship on any other day than Saturday, uh, you're a heathen. It's rubbish. We set aside a day. Doesn't matter what day it is. Um, 
there's no Old Testament law that carries into the New Testament because this is the age of grace. Doesn't mean there's no standards. There are standards. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. Those are very, very high standards. But they're not law. They're standards. They're what God is expecting of us and what we're now capable of doing. Um, therefore, oh no, I read that, didn't I? Um, uh, yeah, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Now, the word slaves kind of has a, an overtone in your mind of working in the cotton field in the heat of the day and, and, uh, and in, engaged in laborious work. It doesn't have that context within the scripture here. It has the context of we are committed to one Lord, one master, and we do what he says. We don't question him or challenge him on what he says. We do it because he will not tell us to do anything that we can't do nor will he tell us to do anything that will hurt us. So we're absolutely safe with him. Yes. Um, but um, some people have trouble understanding that. Um, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. Choice. But also notice that is progressive. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. I've been trying to emphasize to you since the start of the year that in the eyes of the Father you are already holy people because he sees you inside Jesus Christ. Jesus, however, sees you as you really are. And he and his Holy Spirit are working with you to transform you to be the way your Father in Heaven already sees you as being. That's, that's, the, that's the sense of it, the progressive sense of it. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. And what benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things result in death. I can't think of any sinful thing you do that in the long term you're happy with or glad you did it. Quite the opposite. Um, but now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a magnificent gift. All right, back to the notes. You have two charts on the page in front of you, an outline of Romans chapter 6. Uh, from what we just read, verse 6 uh, speaks of the new birth. Uh, verse 6 specifically says, uh, you see at just the right time and we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. This is, this is the, the implementation, the way of salvation, the way in which we can be made righteous. The only way in which we can be made righteous is through the blood of Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. It's, it's implying the new birth because through Christ's death we have life. Uh, verse 11 speaks of the renewing of the mind, which is our responsibility. I, I, I wish it, really wish it wasn't, because it would be so much easier if God just took over and controlled it. But it says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Any time I am tempted to do something wrong, I need to remind myself, no, I am dead to that, I'm alive to Jesus now, but it comes down to the choice that this thing makes. Do I want to pursue that habit or do that thing that I used to do or say those words that I used to say or whatever it might be, or do I want to yield to Jesus Christ? So we have this constant battle in the mind. And it's our job to sort that out, not God's and not the people around us. We each personally are responsible for what's going on behind our eyes. And then verses 19 to 22 show us that we'll have victory in our actions because the Spirit will transform us. To the extent that we yield to Him, 
he is making us more and more and more like Jesus. So if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And that was the subject we finished last week. So looking at those diagrams down the bottom, uh, again, this is just summarising what we've already looked at. Um, on the left is the unregenerate man, the unregenerate woman, the worldly person. Uh, Jeremiah 17.9 says, uh, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That's the heart of all of us, including you and I, prior to Jesus coming in. Uh, our hearts were very untrustworthy, even to ourselves. And because they were influenced by Satan, we were inclined to drop into patterns of thinking, ways of living, actions that were negative, either to ourselves or to others around us. Sometimes we'd get it right and do something really good and really nice. But it's a lot easier to do the good thing, the right thing and the nice thing if your spirit isn't controlled by the enemy. Because you're constantly getting a floodgate of negative stuff. Um, I was talking to someone this week who was telling me they had two opportunities to talk to someone who is dying. Two different people who are dying. In both cases from cancer. And in both cases they refuse to talk about God. Literally, I do not want to hear anything about God. I don't want to speak about God. I don't want to know anything about God. So they are saying, I want to go to hell and suffer in such a way that the pain I'm in now will be almost like joy in comparison. I do not want to hear about God. There are people who are so determined to follow that satanic influence in their head that's telling them, not God, not God, not God, not God, anything else. And they yield to that and they cut themselves off from the source of life. Uh, so then you've got the soul, you know, your mind and your body with its five senses. And Galatians 5, 19 to 21 tells you what those senses are really like. Talking about the flood of dissipation we all jumped into, all the bad things that we once used to do and used to embrace. Um, and in, in the left column is your will, which is a product of your mind. You decide, based on your will, whether you're going to yield to, in the case of the left-hand one there, the, the satanic influence, or what you've been taught by parents and others, the, the laws of the land, all of the stuff that we are given to control ourselves with, and the input from our bodies. The worst part of all of that is the input from our bodies. So much sin comes from the appetites of the flesh that affect the soul. And if we don't reject those appetites of the flesh, we will sin. Okay? Now, Romans 6.6a says we've been crucified with him. The purpose of that is to cut off the satanic influence that was coming into our spirit and to bring in the Holy Spirit influence. Um, take a look at Second Peter, I think, is probably the... The easiest one to get to there. Second Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 4. Uh, in fact, we'll pick it up in verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. <laughs> I love that. They're monumental statements and they are so understated. Yeah. His divine power has given Frank Russell everything Frank needs for life and godliness. His divine power has given Graham everything he needs for life and godliness, has given Lois everything she needs for life and godliness. I could go around and name everybody in the room. His divine power has fully equipped us for a life of godliness. Do we live godly lives? Sometimes, definitely. Other times, not so clear. Okay. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness, through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Again, easy words to read straight over. You may participate in the divine nature. You may become like God. The nature of God is the fruits of Galatians uh, 
Um, Chapter 5, yeah, 22 to 24. It's actually written underneath that second. By the way, that says Galatians 2, 22 to 24 under that right-hand diagram. Please change that to 5, 22 to 24, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control and faithfulness. That's the nature of Christ and that's what the promises of Christ have made available and those are the manifest things we should be showing. And not only spirit-filled people, every single Christian because the fruits are available to every believer. Um, so the difference is now we are a new man or a new person, perhaps would be a, a better thing to say in this day and age, with the Holy Spirit's influence, God's influence directly to our spirit. The Holy Spirit is resident there. You can't get much closer to God than that. Uh, so your heart is perfect. And this is why I've said uh, on numerous occasions, it's never a matter of getting something from your head to your heart. Never. It's the other way around. It's getting it from your heart to your head. Your heart's already got it. Your head is the one that's arguing. No, I don't like that. Um, uh, and, and so your spirit now has an input to your soul, which is much more open. We just have to learn to trust that what God tells us is good, is reliable, is, is, is safe. Um, unlike what it was before. We've had a lifetime of learning to distrust our own conscience, if you like. Um, and then Romans 6.11 deals with the, the soul or the mind and Romans 6.19 deals with the body with its five senses. Um, and the will still, your outworking of what God is wanting to do, still depends on yielding. That has not changed. You are as much dependent now on how much you are prepared to yield your mind to, to the spiritual influences coming into you as you were before. The difference is those spiritual influences are now invariably good, invariably right, and invariably trustworthy, but we are still not trusting. Not always. I can say that safely because if all of you were completely yielded to the Holy Spirit, um, I would probably be on my face on the floor in front of you saying, you wonderful soul, will you pray for me? Um, <laughs> You'd have such a charisma. You'd have the same charisma as Jesus. Um, we're getting closer. We're working on it. We're endeavouring to get there. But the pathway has been marked out for us. The provision has been made for us. It simply requires on us taking up the petition of God to obey. Then we'll have it. It's simple, but so hard. Easy to say, hard to obey. Section four, the renewed mind and the Christian's armor. 4.1, because, because the mind of man is the main battleground after salvation, the mind of woman too, women do have minds, believe it or not, um, the, because the mind of man is, <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely true. <laughs> Each day. Um, because the mind of man is the main battleground after salvation, the Christian's armour spoken of in Ephesians 6, 10 to 18 is primarily related to the renewing of the mind. So guess where we're going? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. We do have an enemy and we do need to defend ourselves. But by the way, when it says take a stand, it doesn't say go and attack. Nowhere in the Bible is any Christian ever told to go and attack a satanic stronghold because you'll get flattened if you try it. Kathy yeah, and I were... Kathy and I were naive enough to try that uh, when we took over the church in Beaufort after the previous pastor had left. We heard someone preach this really exciting sounding message that what you need to do is go to the gateways of your city and take communion and take authority over the devil and command him out of that city and he'll have to yield and go. Um, yeah, go up on the high places. So Beaufort has a hill that's about, oh, about 15 feet high, 
So we went, we went up onto the 15 foot high hill and we took communion and then we drove around to this basically only four roads into, into Beaufort Road, drove around and prayed against Satan's work in that town and that we were just taking over and there's no room for him anymore. It almost destroyed the church, the backlash from that. It's a stupid, inane, childish and wrong thing to do. We are told to take a stand against him. We are never told to go and find him and attack him. Okay? Um, so understand the difference between a stand and an advance. Jesus did all the advancing on our behalf. All we are doing is standing on the ground that he's already claimed and holding it with the weapons that he has provided. Does that make sense to you? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And I have to educate myself daily. It's not against the Dan Andrews. It's not against the, the, um, the um, elbows. It's not against the, the politicians and the bureaucrats who are forcing such evil things upon our children and upon our nation. It's against the satanic powers that are behind them. They are blind, deaf, dumb and stupid. They have no idea what they are doing. They really think they are doing a good thing. Um, well, most of them do. There's one of them I rather suspect is quite willingly cooperating, but I'm not going to name who that one, I think, is. Um, Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, no, it comes to you, you don't go looking for it, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. That's all God says you have to do. There's not even a suggestion there that you go out and fight. You stand. You stand and you are clothed and prepared and equipped to withstand the enemy's onslaught because it's his angels who are actually going to cream this guy in the last days. Um, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Do you know what flaming arrows of the evil one are? Accusations, bad suggestions, criticisms, gossip, all those sorts of things that come to us, they're all the flaming arrows and we already have what we need to quench them. Don't let them lodge in your, in your life somewhere and then regurgitate them to somebody else, okay? Um, um, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Praying in the Spirit, what kind of prayer is that? Exactly so. That's why it's so important. Paul is now not only suggesting to us, he is commanding to us, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Personally, I find that a great relief because I'm not a very effective prayer, but I can easily spend an hour in tongues plus without even hesitating because I'm not having to think, what am I going to say next? What am I going to say next? I've already said that bit. I don't want to say it again. What am I going to say next? Pray in the Spirit. That's the prayer that prevails. Uh, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Not just your close friends, not just the ones on our prayer list. Keep on praying for the church. Keep on praying for the churches across Ballarat, the churches across this country, the churches overseas. Keep praying for those Indian people who are being ho horrendously um, brutalised by a, a, some Hindu extremists. We need to keep praying for people around the world that are holding up the flag and most of all we need to pray for Israel. Um, and pray also for me that whenever at my mouth words may be given to me so that I'll fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. Dare I say, pray for those who are out there doing the hard work. Matthew's enemies, he doesn't like me mentioning him. I'm going to mention you whether you like it or lump it. Pray for this guy when he goes and visits the banditos. Pray for Keith when he goes on the streets in Melbourne or Greg when he goes on the streets in Melbourne. Pray that these guys will find fruitful uh, uh, fields for their labour. 
that they will see a harvest coming in. Pray for the ones who are sharing with their friends and their family. Um, my son the other day astonished us again. He sent us a text. He's been having a bit of trouble at work. He sent us this lovely text quoting a scripture uh, about how you cope with the circumstances when things around you are building up pressure and how God is using this. Uh, and I pray for him as he's praying for others. It inspires me. Uh, and I'm sure you have similar situations. Uh, we need to be people, and a prayer might be no more than just, thank you, God. Bless Graham as he's, as he's making his preparations for this trip to, to uh, Israel, and may he meet wonderful people there, and may he be able to sow some of the gospel seed. That's it. Simple. Not, oh, no, no, no. And his itinerary is blah, 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 blah. And he'll be travelling oh, no, with blah, 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 blah. And he'll be flying on this airline at this time, and he'll be <laughs> staying in this moment. No, yeah, of course, God knows all of that. Um, but for some reason, God has chosen to limit himself to the release that we give to family, friends, and to those around us and across the world. Um, so it puts a heavy onus on us to literally be a prayerful people. Well, we looked at that earlier in this particular study and, and others. Um, so... The theme of the letter to the Ephesians is threefold, and there are three key scriptures which emphasize these themes. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, the emphasis is that we are seated in Christ. We looked at this last week, so we don't really need to go too deep, but I will just read the, the key scripture. Um, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You're not just seated your spirit is already seated in heaven. Think about it. You can't see it, but part of you is already there. Now, some people think that salvation is like booking a ticket or buying an insurance policy. It's nothing like either of those things. At the moment of transaction, part of you is translated to glory. Um, and God sees your spirit. And he sees your spirit inhabited with his spirit do you think he's pleased with you no i think it's all the time all the time we we can grieve him but how many of you have got kids how many of you when your children did something wrong despised them i'm serious or you thought oh no they're wicked little children i'm, I'm not interested in pursuing this anymore they may have upset you, but you love them just as much. And because you love them, you gently correct them. Or not quite so gently sometimes when you have to, but you correct them because you love them. God does the same thing to us. So he's pleased with you all the time. He's pleased with you as his kids, as the ones who have embraced his son. And he thinks you're marvellous. <coughs> so we are seated. That describes your relationship to God and relates to your spirit. <coughs> There's nothing more to do. All right? As far as your spirit and God are concerned, you're seated with him, peaceful in heaven. That's what the Bible declares. So that's the literal truth. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, which is the next section, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Living your life, living it out, this is your walk. Walking describes my relationship to my neighbour and relates to the body. Our relationship with the Father in heaven is already perfect. It cannot be improved. And unless you turn around and deny Jesus Christ, it cannot be impaired or broken. Even if you do wrong things, that relationship is still solid. Okay, the Bible says somewhere that the final judgment, some will come through that judgment with reward, some will come through the judgment as through a fire, meaning you'll basically come in without your clothes, you'll just barely make it, but you will make it through. Now we all want to come through with a blessing of God, knowing that we have helped others and we have done what we were called to do. But that scripture tells us that even if we are miserable, um, 
locking ourselves away, doing nothing to please God, as long as we don't let go of Jesus Christ, we're still going to go to eternity. So the mistakes that we make do not expel us from heaven. The mistakes that we make give God an opportunity to correct us and sometimes to give you a slap on the back of the head. If God's middle name is Jethro, I will not be at all surprised. <laughs> and the third one is uh, chapter 6 and it's epitomised in verse 14. Um, Stand firm then. Standing. Describes my relationship to Satan and relates to the soul. Now, have you noticed, if I'm standing, I'm not moving. I'm not standing anymore. What am I doing? I'm walking. If I stop, I'm standing again. If I walk, I'm moving. We are not to move. God is placing us where he wants us. He's putting us in the right position, in the right way, at the right time. And he wants us to hold the patch of ground that we are standing on. Not necessarily the physical patch, but the spiritual patch. You understand? This church is here to hold on to a certain part of this spiritual city of Ballarat. And its job is to stand here, not to wander around, not to go off looking for, for the enemy here, there or wherever he may be found. The only thing we are to look for are people to bring into the kingdom of God. Not necessarily to this church either, to any church as long as they're looked after, but to bring people into the kingdom. That's our job. Seated with Christ, walking, working on my relationship with people around me. I'd like people to look at me and think, there's a godly fella. They usually, usually don't think that. They probably think there's an athletic, heroic, handsome <laughs> devil. Um, but I don't know that they think that I'm godly. When I work out my salvation with fear and trembling, they will look at me and say, what have you got? We want some. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 says, if someone asks you the reason for the hope that you have, tell him or her but with gentleness and respect. If someone asks you, okay, you don't ask them, they ask you. Um, and... If we are bringing the aroma of Christ, they will ask. You can be absolutely sure of that. So the armour consists of seven pieces of equipment, five pieces are for defence and only two are for attack. What does that tell you? We're more concerned with preventing ourselves from being deluded into thinking we have to move over there or move over there or do something that God hasn't said since we've already pointed out these primarily relate to our walk, not to our physical being. Um, five are for defence. The enemy's not trying to attack your body, although he'll have a swing at it. You know, if there's a virus going by, he'll chuck it at you. Um, he, he will try to make you sick or he will try to distract you. But his principal attack is on your soul. You can't get to your spirit. That's completely locked away. It's on your soul because he wants you to look away from Jesus and start looking at him. You can just imagine Satan prancing around on a stage, waving his arms around saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, do it my way, look at me. And you're trying to look past him to where Jesus is. Do you know what? We have the ability to do that. The trouble is Satan is such a clown, we sometimes drop our eyes and we look at him and for a while we get a little bit lost, which is where things start going wrong in our lives and we have to then refocus and get our eyes back on Jesus and off the clown that's trying to claim centre stage in our lives. So the five pieces of armour are actually five attitudes every Christian must hold in order to reign in this life. Romans chapter 5 verse 17, you've probably still got Romans open. Uh, it's only a couple of pages back if you haven't. Romans 5.17, where you will read, um, um, For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of life, a uh, gift of righteousness, reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ? So you're not only saved from sin, you're actually reigning in life. You're royal. 
God's ambition for national Israel was that they should be a kingdom of priests. Well, guess what? He has the same ambition for the Christian church. And that's what you are. You are reigning as kings and queens under his ultimate kingship. And you are reigning in a way that is or should be beneficial to those around you. If you stop and think how important it is that we do what God wants, you will change the way you relate to people. A bit of new par bragging. Our daughter sent Kathy a message today um, to say that her little son was expected to be how many grams over his birth weight now, Kathy? Supposed to put on 150 to 200 grams of weight. Uh, he's put on 400 and 450. Um, why is that? <laughs> because she's feeding him, she's nurturing him, she's looking after him. I've sat and watched them, the, the two of them, and his dad can't wait to have a go with his son. He's been there now for a fortnight, and his dad still likes to pick him up and just sit on the chair and cuddle him. You know, I think if it hasn't worn off in two weeks, it ain't going to wear off. It's just going to get stronger and stronger. Um, and that's the way we must be with the people around us. We need to nurture, we need to care, and we need to feed wherever we can that they might grow, okay? People won't come to the kingdom because we try to scare them into the kingdom. They'll come in because we offer them something that they suddenly realise they've got a thirst for, a hunger for. Uh, babies don't eat unless they're hungry. Um, but when they are hungry, have the right food and they will grow. The belt of truth. What is your attitude towards the truth? There are two truths, spiritual truth and natural truth. For example, a natural truth is that those chairs you are sitting on are built strong enough to hold your weight. And by faith, each one of you sat down on those chairs. I did not observe any of you tip the chair over and check it for any structural weakness or cracks or anything else. You didn't even look to see whether the naughty pastor might have put an upside down pin in the middle of the chair just to give you a little bit of a lift when you sat down. You just trusted those chairs because your experience tells you a steel chair in good condition is not going to let you down. That's a natural truth. The trouble is there are spiritual truths that are more solid than that and we need to embrace them. And the only way you find spiritual truth is in God's word and the outworking of God's word. Natural truth you can find everywhere. Go on YouTube, you can find out how to do just about anything. I reckon if you owned a Rolls Royce and wanted to pull down the engine, if you went on YouTube, you'd find a score of videos telling you how to dismantle a Rolls Royce and put it back together again. Um, everything in the natural floods us. In the spiritual, there is one channel, and that's it. But this often comes into conflict with natural truth. A natural truth is what governments are now legislating because they think the only way to be fair is to do this or do that and to bring in all sorts of hideously immoral and inappropriate laws. And their natural truth, they justify it by saying, but this is being, this is being fair and equitable, uh, this is being inclusive, this is embracing. The spiritual truth is this is wicked and evil. Which one do you listen to? They'll be coming for these books soon. You can guarantee that. I'm amazed hasn't started already. Uh, make sure you have a couple of Bibles hidden away somewhere because sooner or later, the little men in the black suits are going to be knocking on your door looking for your Bibles because there's too much truth in here and it brings light onto the wickedness in the world right now and because of that light, we can see what's going on people outside can't see so they're carried along by the narrative by the story by the natural truth Christ's righteousness is your only defense against the enemy stand in the righteousness of Christ when the enemy comes at you with condemnation and he will do that how many people in this room have felt condemned in the last week over something or other large or small 
Okay, I see those three fingers. <laughs> Guess what? That's the enemy speaking to you and telling you that you've missed the boat in some area. You have not missed the boat. You're in Jesus Christ. You can't miss the boat. He not only manufactured the boat, he manufactured the water that it floats on. It doesn't matter what the devil tells you. You are not missing out. You are not inferior. You are not going backwards. The truth is God loves you and God has called you according to his foreknowledge and purpose. And that will refute the negativity that might be poured upon you. Okay? Um, the breastplate of righteousness. What is your attitude towards righteousness? There are two kinds of righteous, Christ's and yours. I'll give you an example of yours. Gosh, I'm cool. I'm a good bloke. I always do the right thing. Never tell a lie. I'm just so holy. I'm righteous. I'm wonderful and great. And you're all sitting there thinking, what a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not telling the truth. Self-righteousness is deadly. Because someone who is self-righteous will not listen to anything that contradicts their high opinion of themselves. And oftentimes when God speaks to us, he is contradicting some high opinion we hold of ourselves. Sometimes it's the opposite. He's contradicting a low opinion we hold of ourselves because some people spend so much time in depression and despair that they can't stop kicking themselves and they have a jolly good kick session every morning and then they wonder why they feel miserable. Either way, it's wrong. Christ's righteousness is your only defense against the enemy. When he brings negativity or when he brings temptation or whenever ever he brings one of his nasties against you, you stand in the righteousness of Christ and he will be defeated. The condemnation will fall away because it's an undeserved curse. And 413, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. What is your attitude to your neighbor? There are two ways to see them, in Christ or in the flesh. We are fortunate, we live in one of those rare streets where our neighbours are all good. There's no problems, they're just, they're, just, they're just good. We're the sort of street where there's a rush on a Monday morning uh, to bring each other's bins in. It's almost an unwritten law. Who can, he who gets out earliest gets the most bins in for his neighbours. It's just, it's just a good street. Um, but there are plenty of streets where you have neighbours who are a little bit less nice than the neighbours that we happen to have. And do we show them, this is, this is physical neighbours in your neighbourhood, do we show them Christ's forbearance or do we show them the back of a hand? Do we complain and whinge and suck about what they do? Or do we respond differently? I'm going to tell you something today and you may hear this from the person themselves. Um, one of our Dear church members was scammed this week um, with a very convincing um, person from a certain Asian nation where they're very good at this kind of thing, uh, managed to persuade her to give them her bank details. Oh. She began to suspect it was a scam and she contacted me and I said, get onto your bank straight away. She got onto the bank. The bank, which is the Commonwealth, said, no, there's nothing, nothing's been touched in your account. Um, we'll just cancel your card and everything will be okay. They did not lock or suspend the account. This morning, the account's cleaned out because the bank couldn't be bothered to take action. They could have suspended it until they had time to investigate. They didn't do that, and it's cost her everything. The scammer, would you believe, rang her back today. So thank you. <laughs> well, I don't know what the game was. Maybe they thought she might have had some more money tucked away somewhere. Do you know what she said to them? I forgive you in Jesus Christ for taking my money. The scammer didn't know what to do with it. He said, it wasn't me, it must have been my supervisor, which is probably true. I'll, I'll, I'll get it all back for you. How much did you lose? And she said, no, that's not, that's not important anymore. And she hung up. 
apparently several times he tried to ring back. This is a scammer suddenly developing a conscience because one dear lady said, I forgive you in Jesus' name. Talk about a living example of putting your righteousness right out there on the line. Of living Christ to a godless man. If I'd been speaking to him, it wouldn't have been those words. It would have been words that he could have coped with. He could not cope with what he got. And I think, what a beautiful woman, and I'm fully anticipating God's going to bring it back to her. Okay? And if, if the bank doesn't get it back, I'm going with her to see that bank because they're directly responsible by not freezing the account when they'd been told that the account was breached. They didn't seek enough information from her. They ignored it. Now the money's gone. So, that's being righteous, okay? My righteousness would be to make myself feel really good by giving this guy a mouthful that he would never forget. The Christian righteousness is to say, I forgive you in Jesus' name. Somewhere there's hopefully a bloke on the other side of the world who can't sleep tonight. Yep. Yes. And... Um, 413, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Oh, yeah, that's it. What is your attitude to your neighbour? Um, so she saw this man in Christ. That's what Jesus would have done. She didn't see him in the flesh. I'll give you such a serve. I can't get to you, but I can certainly give you a lashing with my tongue. She didn't. We are commanded to see one another in Christ. And if I can match the example of that lady... I won't name her because, as I said, she may decide to share some of this herself. And if she doesn't, that's her business. But her example to me is, is exemplary and astonishing. Over the page, the shield of faith. Watch your attitude towards your circumstances. There are two methods of evaluation, by faith and by feelings. Guess which one's reliable? It's not how we feel that matters. It's what God declares that matters. I'll give you an instance. Sometimes we come into a meeting. I've, I've, I've done this many times. And you just sit there and the meeting feels as flat and as lifeless. And, oh, <sighs> don't know why I bothered to come today. Gee, the singing's flat. Oh, the musos are off. Oh, no, not that song. Oh, it's too loud. Oh, it's not loud enough. Oh, no, don't tell me Frank's going to preach. Oh, no, it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. I wish I could go home. And that's when it's me preaching. Um, <laughs> and I'll say to Kathy something, wasn't that a terrible meeting this morning? And she'll say, what? It was great. There was fantastic worship. The word was good. The people were happy. It was a fantastic meeting. What's the difference? It's our feelings. If I come in out of sorts, tired, whatever, sometimes depressed, um, then I'll project my feelings onto the meeting and... <laughs> and it happens the other way around with us sometimes too. Kathy will come in. She's the one who's tired and depressed and will project her feelings... And I, because I don't have a, at that particular moment, don't have a, 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 um, a previous expectation of the way things are going to, just get in there and enjoy it and have a ball. Can't rely on your feelings. Every meeting in that hall is a good meeting. Okay? Um, when you open your eyes halfway through and notice that there's over 80 people in the room and they're all singing their hearts out, you think, this is crackerjack. And I think on that occasion you can probably just trust your feelings a little bit because <laughs> something's brought all those extra people in this particular week and we hope they all come back. Um, but by the same token, faith says whenever we gather in, in more than two of us gather together to worship God, he is present in our midst. So whether there's two of us in there, 20 or 200, it'll fit 300 apparently, um, very close fellowship. Um, it's a great meeting because Jesus is in it. 
Okay, that's just one example, but right across life. We can trust our feelings and it overrides our faith and that's the exact opposite. Our faith is of much more worth, much more reliability, much more trustworthiness than our feelings could ever be. So we must be people who live by faith, not by feelings. Faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible and expects the impossible. And then the helmet of salvation, what is your attitude to salvation? Does it stand because of grace or works? Absolutely. It doesn't stand without works, by the way. Because once you get saved, you become a servant of God. And servants do stuff. That's why they're called servants, the serving part. Um, but the servanthood has nothing to do with your salvation. It's a product of your salvation. Your salvation rests entirely on the grace of God who could love us when we were extremely unlovable. And he continues to love us even now when we slip back. As someone sort of hinted before, I know that someone over here said something about sometimes or not always. Even when we slip back and we're not acting graciously and gracefully and lovingly, he still loves us because of his grace. Yes, um, so works are good because it's a way of proving to yourself that you have faith. James says, show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by what I do. And that's the right approach. First faith, then works. You can't work your way into the kingdom and I, I bet that those of you who have tried evangelism of family and or friends along the way, somewhere along the line, at least one of them will have said to you, oh, God, God wouldn't want me. If, if you knew what was in my life or the things I had done, you'd know that God wouldn't, wouldn't touch me with a 40-foot pole. I'd have to clean myself up before God would accept me, which is exactly opposite of the entire new creation message. You cannot clean yourself up. It doesn't matter how much soap you use. Even if it's one of those wonderful soaps that's full of all of the substances that give you pearly white smooth skin and put a delicious perfume onto your body, you are still not clean before God unless you've been washed with the blood of Christ. That's the only thing that will clean us up. All right? The salvation is sure by faith in God's grace. And his grace will cover over a multitude of ills. He loved us when we were unlovable. How much more does he love us when we're seeking to love him back? So the summary. God's word is the truth. Christ is our righteousness. We're not our own righteousness. No one else can be righteous. The church is not our righteousness. No one else. Just Jesus is your righteousness. Not even your own good deeds no, Jesus is your righteousness. So you are righteous by imputation from Christ. Love your enemies because love prevails. Uh, live by faith, not by feelings or by sight. Please, I'm trying. I'm sure you are. Sometimes I wish I could just close my eyes and stop feeling things. Then I might be able to work it out better. Salvation stands sure in spite of any personal failure. I want you to underline that one. Salvation stands sure in spite of any personal failure. And turn to 1 John chapter 1. Right up near the back. Getting very close to that wonderful book of Revelation, you can sort of feel the anointing leaking through the pages. Um, 1 John 1, 8 and 9. Um, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's me as well as you. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So is there any reason for you to fall apart because you did something wrong yesterday? Not if you confessed it to Christ. There's not. No, it's gone. If we claim we have not said we make him out to be alive and his word has no place in our lives. But confess our sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
If you purify a mineral, uh, say gold, you wind up with pure gold, no, imp no impurities in it. It's just the pure metal. Of course, you never buy it that way in jewellery and so on. They always alloy it with other metals because gold is so soft. If you had a solid gold, true gold ring with nothing else in it, you'd be able to bend it with your fingers and it would just wear out in it in six months, 12 months. So they alloy it. That makes it stronger. In our case, if we try to alloy our faith with anything else, we make it weaker because it's perfect when it is, when it is clear and it is cleansed and pure and God does that for us and any time we try to alloy our walk with a little bit of side sin somewhere we need to get that out of the place so confess it to Jesus Christ he will purify you sometimes the purification process is pretty rough if you were a bit of gold dust you all got a rough life ahead of you as you go through the furnace to get all the impurities burnt out and the dross removed. It's not always nice being purified. I have to say that because I've experienced and so have you. But that's where God is. Salvation is sure. Uh, the enemy will tell you it's not. It is, in spite of any personal failure. Don't think because you've got some personal failure that you're any worse than anyone else because we all have personal failure at different times. It might be in a different way, but we all have it. Does that mean we just accept it? No, it does not. I mean, God is gradually strengthening you so you won't keep making the same mistakes. <laughs> There's a very wise proverb out there. It's one of the few wise proverbs that's not biblical. It says, if you keep doing the same thing in the same way, expecting a different outcome, that's the definition of insanity. It's very, very valid. If you keep doing the same thing, it will never get better. It will always produce the same outcome if it's, a, if it's a negative thing. But if you do what God wants, it will always improve you. Always. It will always work out better every time. The operative, I don't know what the opposite of insanity is. Ultimate sanity, I guess, is to obey Christ. The word quickened and revealed by the Spirit, this is particularly the rhema, the word from the word, um, is powerful and effective weapon. It's a powerful and effective defence. It's a powerful and effective guidepost. It's a powerful and effective, but particularly it's a weapon against the enemy when he comes against you. Jesus answered Satan's temptations by quoting the word at him. By the way, Satan quoted the word inappropriately at Jesus to try to tempt him. There's a lot of false teachers out there today who will quote the word at you inappropriately to try to tempt you to wander down a pathway of error. Half the time they are unaware of what they're doing that what they're trying to teach you is non-biblical because their own eyes are blinkered. They've come in with an idea and they're using the Bible to prove it instead of coming into the Bible to form your ideas. That's the way you've got to come in. You can't bring your wisdom into the Word. You've got to take the Word's wisdom into you. All right? And prayer always prevails. Doesn't always seem to, but it does. 4.2, our enemies, the flesh and the devil and how to conquer them. The flesh... We overcome by walking in the Spirit. Okay, we've read Galatians 5. We've, we've looked at how do you walk in the Spirit. You get familiar with God's Word. You spend time in worship and praise. And you then begin to apply self-control based on those first two. The devil we overcome by confessing or stating our legal justified position in Christ. Next time the devil has a crack at you, you tell him out loud. N not, not in the middle of a crowded supermarket or if you're sitting in a, in a play or a cinema or something and you d jump up in your seat and you say, Devil! No! <laughs> uh, because Pet Lorange, you might not understand that you're having a very special spiritual moment with God and dealing with the devil. But in your own time, most of the time when the devil comes at you, it's after dark. You notice that? It's at night. Because he's a creature of the dark, not of the light. Um, and it's while you're sort of half asleep is where some of these weird things come into your head, such as you're not good enough. You are good enough. You've always been good enough. You always will be good enough. If you lose both your arms, both your legs, and your brain goes gaga, you'll still be good enough. 
because God will still love whatever is left. And at the end of days, when whatever is left dies and your spirit's released, it'll be as perfect and as whole as it's ever been. So anyone who's lost someone, for example, to dementia, I don't know how you last saw them, but the next time you see them, they'll be perfect. Everything restored. It's the way God works. All right. Um, justification and our acceptance and confession of this truth forms our main defence against the enemy. Let me close this by quoting to you John chapter 14 and verse 30 from the Amplified Bible. And this... If nothing else, if you ever get your chance to buy an Amplified Bible, have one on the shelf. It's not a Bible for daily reading because it is so wordy it'll take you two years to read it rather than one. But it's worth working through it. John 14.30 says, I will not talk with you much longer for the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of this world is coming. And he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. He has no power over me. Could I urge you to memorize those words? He has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him. He has no power over me. And you quote those words. And you will start to transform from the enemy's plaything to his dreaded enemy. Okay? He will flee from you when you resist the word. On the back page, there is um, basically in tabular form what we've been discussing. I'll leave you to go through that on your own. We can look at it if you want to, but um, it's just a comparison between justification, the fact that legally all these things are already true of you, which is your defense against the devil, and regeneration which is the basis of our walk in the Spirit, and gradually, day by day, getting to be more like Christ. And in fact, we'll quickly go down those tables. Um, justification is us in Christ. We are in Jesus Christ. All right, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Uh, you can scribble beside that, Colossians 2, chapters 9 and 10 as well, if you like. Um, relates to the whole person, spirit, soul, and body. And... From the scriptures that are given on the right there, you are perfect, redeemed, sanctified, healthy and holy. If I can get you to actually believe that, you will not fall prey to the enemy again. You will not follow temptation. You will not go the wrong way because your path will be illuminated. You are not inferior, none of you. My attitude is my stand against the enemy. See 1 John 14, 30, which we just read in the Amplified. Works have no place in this because it's a position of faith based upon the finished work of the cross. And when Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't joking. It's a legal position called our standing. Um, and it, it protects us. All right? And the word is the evidence. We confess it. Romans 10, 9 and 10. What does that say? Come on. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be. There's nothing in there about your past life. There's nothing in there about what mistakes you might make the next day. It's right there in black and white. And you could put number seven under there. It's complete and instantaneous at salvation because it is. Then regeneration, the basis for our walk in the spirit, and if you want scriptures for these, just scribble beside that heading, Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verse 14, and justification, just scribble Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. So Ephesians 1, 17 for justification and regeneration, Ephesians uh, 3, 14. This relates to Christ in us, the Jesus in you that's making you more holy and better. Um, Galatians 2.20 is a, is a better proof text for that than Colossians 1.27. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Um, the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, the, the, us in Christ is the Ark of Noah. We're inside the Ark. Christ in us is the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was enclosed inside the temple and you are a temple of the Holy Ghost. So you have him in you. Um, relates to the spirit of a person, not the soul and the body. It, it, um, and again, you're perfect, redeemed, sanctified, healthy and holy. 
And there are three proof texts for that. My attitude as I walk before the Lord because he sees my heart. Works become the fruit of my walk in the Spirit, but God views my heart, not my state. Okay, I've tried to emphasize that to you before. When God the Father looks at you, he sees a little Jesus. Um, an experiential position called our state, and this is where it changes us. Our standing protects us, our state changes us, and experience is the evidence. We feel it. I know I'm a lot different now to what I was uh, hmm, 43 years ago. I'd want to be, and not just because I've lost hair, but I mean the person that I am. Very different. I'm probably different to what I was last Sunday. And you could add a seventh one there. It is progressive as I grow by the work of the Holy Spirit in me. Okay? That's it. God bless you. Thank you.